Hello again, this is uh, Jesse Johnson from Tutoring with a Twist, and we'll be reading a little bit more of Journey to the Center of the Earth today. Uh, last time we saw our protagonists um, delve down towards the center of the Earth through a volcano in Iceland, um, before taking a bit of a wrong turn and suffering from some severe dehydration. Now, uh, the three of them have you know, found a source of water, and um, are hoping to delve even deeper. So, with that said, let's continue. Chapter 24. Well said, old mole. Canst thou work at the ground so fast? By the next day, we had all forgotten our sufferings. At first, I was surprised to find I was no longer thirsty, and I was wondering why. The answer came in the murmuring of the stream at my feet. We had breakfast, and she drank some of the excellent iron-laden water. I felt totally bucked up and quite determined to push on. Why should such a firmly convinced man as my uncle, assisted by such a hard-working guide as Hans, and accompanied by such a determined nephew as myself, not succeed in his aim? This was the sort of excellent thought that was going round in my head. If anyone had suggested to me that I should return to the summit of Snaefell, I would have declined with indignation. Fortunately, all we had to do was to go down. Let's make a start, I cried, awakening by my shouts the echoes of the vaulted hollows of the earth. On Thursday, at 8 a.m., we started off again. The winding granite tunnel led us round unexpected bends and turns, and seemed almost a formal labyrinth, but on the whole, its direction seemed to be southeasterly. My uncle constantly consulted his compass to keep a check on the ground we were covering. The gallery sloped down very slightly from the horizontal scarcely more than two inches in every six feet, and the stream ran gently burbling at our feet. I thought of it as a friendly spirit guiding us underground, and with my hand I caressed the soft water nymph whose comforting voice accompanied our steps. With my reviving spirits, these mythological notions just seemed to spring into my mind. As for my uncle, he was beginning to rage against our horizontal passage. He was a man for vertical paths. This route seemed to be extending indefinitely, and instead of sliding along a core of the circle as we were now doing, he would have much preferred to drop down the Earth's radius. But there was nothing we could do about it, and so long as we were approaching the center to some extent, we felt we mustn't complain. From time to time, a steeper path appeared. Our naiad then began to tumble before us with a hoarser murmur, and we descended with her to a greater depth. On the whole, that day and the next, we made considerable progress horizontally, but very little vertically. On Friday evening, the 10th of July, we were according to our calculations 30 leagues southeast of Reykjavik, and at a depth of two and a half leagues. At our feet, there now opened a terrifying abyss. My uncle, however, was not to be put off, and he clapped his hands with pleasure at the steepness of the descent. This will take us a long way, he exclaimed and without much difficulty, because the protections in the rock make for good staircase. The ropes were fastened by Hans in such a way as to prevent any accidents, and the descent began. I can hardly call it perilous, because I was beginning to be familiar with this kind of exercise. This well, or abyss, was a narrow cleft in the granite mass, called by geologists a fault, and caused by the unequal cooling of the globe of the earth. If it had at one time been a passage for eruptive matter thrown up by Snaefell, I couldn't understand why no trace remained of it passing through. We kept going down a kind of winding staircase, which seemed almost to have been made by human hands. Every quarter of an hour, we were forced to stop for a short rest to allow our knees to recover. We would then sit down on a fragment of rock and talk as we ate and drank from the stream. Of course, Hans's brook was falling in a cascade down this fault, and had lost some of its volume, but there was enough and to spare to slake our thirst. Besides, when the incline became more gentle, it would naturally resume its peaceful course. At this point, it reminded me of my worthy uncle, with his frequent fits of impatience and anger, while below it ran with the calmness of the Icelandic hunter. On the 11th and 12th of July, we kept following the spiral curves of this fault, penetrating at an actual distance no more than two leagues. 
but being carried to a depth of five leagues below sea level. On the 13th, about noon, the fault turned towards the southeast, with a much gentler slope, one of about 45 degrees. Then the road became monotonously easy. It couldn't be otherwise, as there was no landscape to vary the stages of our journey. On Wednesday the 15th, we were seven leagues underground, and had traveled fifty leagues from Snaefell. Although we were tired, we were in perfect health, and had not yet had any reason to open the medicine chest. Every hour, my uncle noted the readings on the compass, the chronometer, the manometer, and the thermometer, exactly as he has published in his scientific report of our journey. It was therefore not difficult to know exactly where we were. When he told me that we had traveled fifty leagues horizontally, I couldn't hold back an exclamation of astonishment at the thought that we had not now long since left Iceland behind us. What's the matter? he exclaimed. I was just thinking that if your calculations are correct, we are no longer under Iceland. Do you think so? It's easy to check, I said, and examining the map and using a pair of compasses, I added, I wasn't wrong. We've passed Cape Portland, and those fifty leagues bring us out into the middle of the ocean. Under the ocean, my uncle said, rubbing his hands with delight. Can we really be? I said. Is the ocean spread out above our heads? Of course, Axel. What could be more natural? Aren't there coal mines at Newcastle that extend to far out under the sea? It was all very well for the professor to call this natural, but I couldn't feel entirely relaxed at the thought that the boundless ocean was rolling above my head. And yet, it really mattered very little whether it was plains and mountains that covered our heads, or the Atlantic waves, so long as we were protected by an arch of solid granite. Anyway, I quickly got used to the idea, as the tunnel, at times running straight, at other times winding as capriciously in its inclines and in its turnings, but constantly keeping its southeasterly direction and always going deeper, was gradually taking us to very great depths indeed. Four days later, on Saturday, the 18th of July, in the evening, we arrived at a kind of vast grotto, and here my uncle paid Hans his weekly wages, and it was agreed that the next day, Sunday, should be a day of rest. Chapter 25. De Profundus. I therefore awoke the next day, relieved from concerns about an immediate start, and although we were in the deepest of chasms, there was something quite pleasant about it. Besides, we were beginning to get accustomed to this troglodyte life. I no longer thought about the sun, the moon, or the stars, nor about trees, houses, and towns, nor about any other of those superfluous things that those who live on the Earth's surface consider necessities. Being fossils, we considered all those things as mere nothings. The grotto formed an immense hall. Along its granite floor ran our faithful stream. At this distance from its spring, the water was scarcely warm, and we drank it with pleasure. After breakfast, the professor spent a few hours sorting his daily notes. First, said he, I'll make a calculation to ascertain our exact position. I hope, after our return, to draw a map of our journey which will be, in reality, a vertical section of the globe, containing the path of our expedition. It'll be very interesting, uncle, but are your observations sufficiently accurate to enable to do that correctly? Yes, I have everywhere observed the angles and inclines. I'm sure there are no errors. Let's see where we are now. Look at the compass and tell me what direction it indicates. I looked and replied carefully. Southeast by east. Well, answered the professor, after a rapid calculation, I reckon we've gone 85 leagues since we started. And so we're under the mid-Atlantic. We certainly are. And perhaps at this very moment, there's a storm above us, and ships above our heads are being roughly tossed about by the tempest. Quite probably. And there are whales lashing the roof of our prison with their tails. It may be, Axel, but don't worry. They won't do us any harm here. Well, let's go back to our calculations. We are 85 leagues southeast of Snaefell, and I reckon we're at a depth of 16 leagues. 16 leagues? I cried. No doubt. Why, this is the very limit assigned by science to the thickness of the crust of the Earth. I don't deny it. And here, according to the law of increasing temperature, there ought to be a heat of 1,502 degrees Celsius. So there should, my boy. 
and all the solid granite ought to be in a liquid state. Uh, you see that it is not so, and that, as so often happens, facts arise to overthrow theories. I'm forced to agree with you, but nevertheless it's surprising. What does the thermometer say? 27.6 degrees. Therefore, the scientists are out by 1474.4 degrees, and the theory of proportional increase in temperature is a mistake. Therefore, Humphrey Davy was right, and I'm not wrong in agreeing with him. What do you say now? Nothing. In truth, I had a good deal to say. In no way did I accept Davy's theory. I still held to the notion of central heat, although I couldn't feel its effects. To tell the truth, I prefer to think that this chimney of an extinct volcano, lined with lavas, which are non-conductors of heat, simply didn't allow the heat to pass through its walls. But without stopping to think up new arguments, I simply accepted our situation as it was. Well, admitting all your calculations to be quite correct, you must follow me to draw one definite conclusion from them. Go ahead, my boy. Feel free to speak. At the latitude of Iceland, where we now are, the radius of the Earth, the distance from the center to the surface, is about mm, 1,583 leagues. Let's say 1,600 leagues in round figure. So, out of 1,600 leagues, we've done 12? As you say. And so, we have gone down these 12 leagues at a cost of 85 leagues diagonally? Exactly so. In about 20 days? Yes. Now, 16 leagues are a hundredth part of the Earth's radius. At this rate, it'll take us 2,000 days, or nearly five and a half years, to get to the center. The professor didn't reply. And what's more, if a vertical depth of 16 leagues can be achieved only by a diagonal descent of 84, it follows that we must go 8,000 miles in a southeasterly direction. So we'll emerge at some point on the Earth's circumference instead of getting to the center. I'll confound your figures and your theories, shouted my uncle in a sudden rage. What are they based on? How do you know that this passage doesn't run straight to our destination? And besides, there's a precedent. What one man has done, another may do. I hope so, but I still have the right to- You have the right to hold your tongue, Axel. But not to talk in that stupid way. I see the prof terrible professor threatening to burst out of the skin of my uncle, and I took timely warning. Now, look at the bonometer. What does it say? It says we are under considerable pressure. Very good. So, you see that by going down gradually and getting accustomed to the density of the atmosphere, we don't suffer at all. Nothing except a little pain in the ears. That's nothing. And you may get rid of even that by rapid breathing whenever you feel the pain. Quite so, I said, determined not to say anything that might run counter to my uncle's prejudices. There's even a positive pleasure in living in this dense atmosphere. Have you observed how intense sound is down here? Uh, no doubt it is. A deaf person would eventually hear perfectly. But won't this density increase? Uh, yes, according to a not-quite-understood law. It's well known that gravity lessens as one goes lower. You know that it's at the center of the globe that its effects is felt most, and that at the center of the globe, objects have no weight at all. I'm aware of that, but tell me, won't air end up with a density of water? Of course, under a pressure of 710 atmospheres. And how about even deeper still? Deeper, the density will increase even more. Then how will we go down? Well, we must fill our pockets with stones. But you've got an answer for everything, haven't you, Uncle? I didn't dare venture any further into the realms of hypothesis, for I might eventually have stumbled on an impossibility that would have enraged the professor. Still, it was clear that the air, under a pressure which might reach thousands of atmospheres, would sooner or later reach the solid state, and then, even if our bodies could bear the strain, we would be brought to a halt, and no amount of reasoning would be able to take us any further. But I didn't put forward this argument. My uncle would have countered it with his inevitable sacnusum, a precedent which counted for nothing with me, for even if the journey on the, the learned Icelander really was attested, there was one very simple answer. Then in the 16th century, there were neither barometers nor morometers, and therefore Seknusum couldn't have known how far he had gone. But I kept this objection to myself, and waited to see how things would turn out. The rest of the day was passed in calculations and in conversations. I remained a steadfast supporter of the opinions of Professor Lindenbrock, and I envied the solid indifference of Hans. 
who, without going into causes and effects, went blindly on to wherever his destiny led him. Chapter 26 The Worst Peril of All I must confess that up to this point, things had not gone badly, and I had had little reason to complain. If our difficulties got no worse, we might hope to reach our goal, and to what a height of scientific glory would we then attain? I had become quite a Lindenbrock in my thinking. Seriously, I had. But this state of affairs due to the strange place I was now living in? Perhaps. Several days, steeper inclines, some terrifyingly close to perpendicular, took us deeper and deeper into the interior of the earth. Some days, we advanced nearer to the center by a league and a half, or nearly two leagues. These were perilous descents, in which Hans's skill and incredible coolness were invaluable. The calm Icelander gave of himself with an incomprehensible lack of concern, and thanks to him we crossed many a dangerous spot which we would never have cleared alone. But his habit of silence was increasing day by day, and was infecting us, too. External objects produce definite effects on the brain. A man shut up between four walls soon loses the power to associate words and ideas together. How many prisoners in solitary confinement become idiots? if not mad, for lack of exercise for the faculty of thought. During the fortnight following our last conversation, nothing happened that's worth recording. But I have good reason to remember one very serious incident which took place about this time, and of which I could scarcely even now forget the smallest details. By the 7th of August, our successive descents had brought us to a depth of 30 leagues. That is, for 30 leagues above our head, there were solid beds of rock, oceans, continents, and towns. We must have been two hundred leagues from Iceland. On that day, the tunnel led down a gentle slope. I was ahead of the others. My uncle was carrying one of the room corp lamps, and I the other. I was examining the beds of granite. Suddenly turning around, I realized I was alone. Oh well, I thought. I've been going too fast, or Hans and my uncle have stopped along the way. Well, that won't do. I must rejoin them. Fortunately, there is not much of an ascent. I retraced my steps. I walked for a quarter of an hour. I gazed into the darkness. I shouted. No reply. My voice was lost in the midst of the cavernous echoes which alone replied to my call. I began to feel uneasy. A shudder ran through me. Just keep calm, I said aloud to myself. I'm sure I'll find my companions again. There aren't two paths. I've just gone too far ahead. All I have to do is retrace my steps. For half an hour, I climbed up. I listened for someone's calling, and in that dense atmosphere, a voice could carry a long way. But there was a dreary silence in the whole of that long gallery. I stopped. I wanted to believe that I was just disoriented, not lost. I was sure I would find my way again. Come on now, I repeated. Since there's only one passage, and they're in it, I'm bound to find them again. All I have to do is keep going up. Unless, indeed, missing me and... Supposing me to be behind them, they're, they too have retraced their steps. But even in that case, all I have to do is walk faster than them. I'll find them, I'm sure I will. I repeated these words in fainter tones of a man only half convinced. Besides, to form even such simple ideas into words and think them through took time. A doubt then gripped me. Was I really ahead when we had become separated? Yes, I definitely was. Hans was behind me and in front of my uncle. He had even stopped for a moment to adjust the pack on his shoulders. I could remember that little incident. It was at that very moment that I must have gone on. Besides, I thought, I have not a guarantee that I won't lose my way. A thread in the labyrinth that cannot be broken. My faithful stream? I only have to follow it back and I'm bound to meet up with them. This conclusion revived my spirits, and I resolved to resume my march without wasting any more time. How I then blessed my uncle's foresight in preventing the hunter from blocking up the hole in the granite. This kindly spring, after having satisfied our thirst along the way, would now be my guide through this labyrinth in the terrestrial crust. Before starting off again, I thought a wash would do me good. I stooped to bathe in Hans's brook. My stupefaction and utter dismay, all I could feel was rough dry granite. The stream was no longer flowing at my feet. Chapter 27. Lost in the Bowels of the Earth. 
To express my despair would be impossible. No words could describe it. I was buried alive with the prospect before me of dying of hunger and thirst. Automatically, I swept the ground with my hands. How dry and hard the rock seemed. But how could I have left the course of the stream? For the terrible fact was that it was no longer running beside me. Then I understood the reason for the terrible silence when I had last listened for any sound from my companions. At the moment when I left the correct path, I hadn't noticed the absence of the stream. It was clear that when I had reached a fork in the path, Hans's brook, following the whims of another incline, had gone off with my companions into unknown depths. How was I to get back? There was no trace of their footsteps, nor of my own, for feet left no marks in the granite floor. I racked my brain for a solution to this problem. One word described my position. Lost. Lost at an immeasurable depth. Thirty leagues of rock seemed to be weighing down on my shoulders with a dreadful pressure. I felt crushed beneath it. I tried to make myself think about the things on the surface of the earth. I could hardly manage to. Hamburg, the house in the Konigstrasse, my poor Graben, all that busy world underneath which I was wandering about was passing in rapid confusion through my terrified memory. I could see again, with vivid reality, all the incidents of our journey, Iceland, Mr. Fridrikson, Snaefell. I told myself that, in such a position as I was now in, to cling to even a single glimmer of hope would be madness, and that the best thing I could do was to give myself up to despair. What human power could restore me to the light of the sun by tearing apart the huge arches of rock which joined together over my head, buttressing each other with impenetrable strength? Who could place my feet on the right path and bring me back to my company? Oh, uncle, burst from my lips in the tone of despair. It was the only word of reproach I uttered, for I knew how much he would be suffering looking for me, wherever he might be. When I saw myself in this way, far removed from all human help and unable to do anything to save myself, I turned to heaven for aid. Memories of my childhood and of my mother, whom I had only known in my tender early years, came back to me, and I knelt in prayer, imploring the divine assistance I was so little worthy of. This return to trust in God's providence made me calmer, and I was able to concentrate the full force of my intelligence on my situation. I had three days' provision with me, and my flask was full. But I couldn't remain alone for long. Should I go up or down? Up, of course, always up. That way I would be bound to arrive at the point where I had left the stream, that fateful turning of the path. With the stream at my feet, I might hope to regain the summit of Snaefell. Why hadn't I thought of that sooner? Here, clearly, was a chance of reaching safety. The most pressing need was to find the course of Hans's brook again. I got up, leaning on my iron pointed stick. I ascended the gallery. The slope was rather steep. I walked on with hope and without hesitation, like a man who has only one path to follow. For half an hour, I met with no obstacle. I tried to recognize my way by the fractures, but no particular sign struck me, and I soon found that this gallery could not take me back to the turning point. I came to an abrupt end. I met an impenetrable wall and collapsed on the rock. Unable, unspeakable despair, then gripped me. I lay there, overwhelmed, aghast. My last hope had been shattered against this granite wall. Lost in this labyrinth, whose winding paths crisscrossed each other in all directions, there was no longer any point in thinking of escape. Here I must die the most dreadful of deaths. And strange to say, the thought crossed my mind that when some day my petrified remains were found thirty leagues below the surface in the bowels of the earth, the discovery might lead to some serious scientific discussions. I tried to speak out loud, but only hoarse sounds passed my dry lips. I was panting for breath. In the midst of my agony, a new terror laid hold of me. When I had fallen, my lamp had been damaged. I couldn't fix it, and its light was getting dimmer and would soon disappear altogether. I watched the luminous curtain current growing weaker and weaker in the wire coil. A dim procession of moving shadows seemed to be slowly unfolding down the darkening walls. I hardly dared shut my eyes for one moment, for fear of losing the slightest glimmer of this precious light. At each moment, it seemed to about to vanish, and I could feel the dense blackness come rolling in upon me. One last trembling glimmer shot feebly up. I watched it in trembling anxiety. 
I drank it in as, as if I could preserve it, concentrating the full power of my eyes on it, as if on the very last sensation of light they were ever to experience. And the next moment I lay in the heavy gloom of deep, thick, unfathomable blackness. A terrible cry of angri anguish burst from me. On earth, even in the middle of the darkest night, light never altogether fails in its duties. It's still there, subtle and diffuse. But no matter how little there may be, the eye still catches that little. Here, there was not a glimmer. The total darkness made me totally blind. Then I lost my head. I got up with my arms stretched out in front of me, attempting painfully to feel my way. I began to run wildly, hurrying through the inextricable maze, still going down, still running through the substance of the earth's thick crust, a struggling denizen of geological faults, crying, shouting, yelling, soon bruised by banging against the jagged rock, falling and getting up, again bleeding, trying to drink the blood which covered my face, and expecting at any moment to shatter my skull against some wall of rock. I will never know where my mad dash took me. After some hours had passed, no doubt exhausted, I collapsed like a lifeless lump along the wall and lost consciousness. So that's going to do it for today. We're at a bit of a, of a low point, um, but we'll be certain to pick it up next time. Um, and hopefully there will be a, a solution to this crisis. I'll be seeing you next week.